Was that a great lunch? Was that nice? Yay! Very, very good. And it was served at the correct time, so nobody's going to gain any weight whatsoever. Uh, the wonderful thing about this lunch is that you never know how the occasion is going to turn out, OK? So I left a note at home, out to lunch, if not back by five, out to dinner as well. <laughs> I just warn you, this event can end in disgrace, and anybody on Kathy Lett's table, uh, mind your liver. That's all I'm saying about it. So the thing I always wish, I always wish this, I could wrap this room up and show it to every young girl in the country so she knows that no aspiration is too high, no achievement beyond her reach. I wish you were all running the world. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, brother, applause yourselves. So many wise women. Do you ever think about that, how the nativity story would have worked out if it had been wise women? Seriously. <laughs> the story would have been totally different. First of all, they'd have asked directions. <laughs> they'd have arrived on time. They'd have helped deliver the baby. <laughs> they'd have brought practical gifts. You imagine Mary's going, frankincense, what's I supposed to do with that? <laughs> they'd have cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and there would have been peace on earth. I tell you, <laughs> it would have been brilliant. So I went uh, during the lunch, it's such a mum thing, I went to check, my daughter was all right. Uh, she's way older than she needs to be for me to look after her. Uh, so I just went to check that she was okay, and uh, I was reminded of my favourite, I tell you my favourite joke, which I used to tell the kids when they were little, but I don't think they had any real understanding of what I was talking about. Uh, so a young girl, she's 17, she wants to stay home by herself, very first time, the parents are going to allow this. Uh, they're a bit worried, but they need, they need a break, they need to go away for the weekend, so go away, and mum rings up on the Friday night, she says, is everything all right? And the daughter says, uh, yeah, the cat died. And uh, the mother goes, that's not how you tell people who are away, news like that. That's, uh, that's not what you do. What you do is I ring up and you say, I'm a bit worried, the cat's on the roof and won't come down. And then I'll ring you the next morning and uh, you say to me, the cat's still on the roof, won't eat, it's not looking good. And the third phone call, you say, Mum, I'm afraid the cat died. I'm prepared for it. I've, I've worked my way up to it. The daughter says, Mum, I didn't realise I'm really trying to get this right thing about being on my own. I'm so sorry. So the mum says, OK. So she rings up the next day. Everything all right? Yes, I'm afraid Granny's up on the roof and she won't come down. <laughs> So, uh, we have a, uh, a room full of wonderful women, but you know, I've been hosting this uh, lunch for many, many years, uh, and each year, one of the things I also see when I look out at your wonderful faces uh, is the shadows of those fantastic women who we have lost uh, during the course of year. Uh, two great funny women uh, no longer with us, Carolina Hearn, a gift from the comic gods, uh, who passed away just 52 years old. Uh, she truly had funny bones, and she showed us worlds we all recognized, uh, but we hadn't realized, I think, were so achingly hilarious. Uh, the genius, too, that I had the great privilege of working with, the wonderful Victoria Wood, uh, so brilliant at making us laugh at the quirkiness of the British character. Uh, the thing I think was so wonderful about Victoria, she was never unkind, um, but she was so skilled at finding the funny in the details of life. Uh, the award-winning novelist and art historian, Anita Bruckner, uh, also no longer with us. Uh, the writer and television broadcaster, the lovely lady I think we thought uh, could solve all our problems, our favorite agony auntie, Denise Robertson. Uh, actress and former first lady of the United States, Nancy Reagan. Uh, what a catalog of comedy we had from Carla Lane, who wrote The Liver Birds, uh, Butterflies and Bread, and she was one of the first who dared to make women funny, uh, one of my great heroes. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning Harper Lee, who wrote the astonishing uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, which has influenced a generation. Uh, and the world is a sadder place, I have to say, without Jean Alexander, who will always be Hilda Ogden in our hearts. And I, I can hardly bear to say the next name. The world is bereft without the MP Joe Cox, uh, who's senseless. <laughs> whose senseless and shocking death reminds us that while we do have political differences with each other, there are still certain fundamental principles held by all in Britain, of the value of democracy and the right to speak up for what you believe in. She was an amazing woman. Uh, so painful uh, to have lost them, uh, but all the more reason, I think, to celebrate how blessed we are uh, by the company that we keep today. Uh, let us make sure that we live in the moment. Please try and make sure you talk to as many people as possible. Don't be shy. You are all women of the year. We meet on an absolute level playing field where all are equally welcome. 
uh, and valued. So, so what I have amongst us, so I'm going to pick out a few people. We have uh, fantastic actors, writers, scientists, politicians, soldiers, farmers. Honestly, pick a thing, and uh, it's here in the room. Uh, let's just say ha hello to a few of you. I I'm spoiled for choice, so please forgive me if I, I don't get this right. Uh, there are lots of actresses in the room, and I don't just mean women pretending they're not wearing Spanx. Um, <laughs> or that they're comfortable in those shoes. Um, uh, fantastic actress, director, currently playing Hermione Granger in the stage play Harry Potter, Noma Dumaswani. Where are you, Noma? There she is. We have wonderful women in the room uh, reminding us that age is just a number. An 88-year-old marathon runner, Ivor Barr, is here. Where are you, Ivor? There we go. You're an inspiration, Iva. I want you to know that I joined a health club this year. It cost me 850 quid, and I don't feel any fitter. I hadn't understood paying the money is not enough. You have to turn up. It's, uh... <laughs> so I'm going to take some, some, some leaves out of your book. Uh, we have a swathe of great campaigners. Uh, the founder of the Dynamics Community Centre in Lambeth set up when her son was murdered. Let's hear it for Minister Lorraine Jones. Where are you? <laughs> Uh, the woman who set up the Afro-Caribbean Leukemia Trust, which over the last 20 years has recruited over 60,000 people of all ethnicities to the stem cell registers, saving many lives. It's Beverly de Gale. Where's Beverly? Uh, also, representatives of our wonderful armed services here today, including Lieutenant Colonel Lucy Giles, uh, who was awarded the most inspirational award at the Women in Defence Awards and was also given the Women of the Year 2016 award. Where are you? There she is. So, too many people. So we thought we'd play this game, and I have no idea how this is going to work out, OK? We're going to play random person in the room, OK? <laughs> Uh, so I just thought everybody in, here, in this room has got a story. I have no idea how this is going to work out. It may be somebody who says, oh, I was made to come. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> under your chair, under, we didn't know what the seating plan was when I did this. Under your chair, a chair, just one chair, there is an envelope. Please look under your chair and see if there's an envelope. And if you have an envelope, please put your hand up in the air. <laughs> has anybody got an envelope? Under the... Have we got one? We've got one. Okay, so up you get. You are my random person in the room. Up you get. Fantastic. Have we got a microphone? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, uh, so, oh, because I genuinely believe everybody has a story, can you tell me what your name is? My name is Razan Alsos. Razan. What is, can you very briefly tell us why it is that you're here at the lunch today? Um, I think because I'm originally from Syria and I came here about four years ago and established my business uh, three years ago and we managed to achieve um, a good successful business. What kind of business is it? Um, I make halloumi cheese. <laughs> oh. uh, I call it Yorkshire halloumi. And um, it's been award-winning uh, Bronze Prize World Cheese Award 2014, uh, Golden Prize uh, for World Cheese Award 2015, and Silver for Best Cheese Award. And now it's nominated Best Cheese in Yorkshire. Wow! <laughs> so let me just get this straight, Razan. Did you have to flee Syria? You had to leave. Yeah, actually, um, we lived. Uh, we we left Syria after an explosion happened at my husband's office. And we did, I've got uh, three kids at that moment. And when we arrived here, my son was 10, man, 10 months old. Now he's five years old. And I've got two daughters as well. Now they are six and seven, seven and eight. When we arrived, they were two and three. Well, uh, we are, that's a fantastic story. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Rosanne. There you go. I love that cheese, man. I, that suddenly, I think I want to make cheese. That's a. <laughs> Did you hear about the explosion at the cheese factory? There was debris everywhere. Um, <laughs> don't start me. There's a surprising number of cheese jokes. Right. <laughs> we are. 
going to crack on with the awards. Please, uh, please welcome back my friend, our chair, Jane Luca, uh, to thank the many people who make this event possible. Jane. To see, I changed my jacket back oh, to host. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Well, I hope you all enjoyed your wonderful lunch today. Um, and actually, just listening to hearing people talk in the room, um, one of the things that our guests always say is that they wish they'd had more time to talk to people and share each other's stories and hear ex experiences. So I'm delighted that today we're announcing the launch of our alumni club, which will give us all the opportunity to come together throughout the year at other events and to hear speakers from our Women of the Year family. Uh, so I'll be writing to you all um, in the coming weeks to let you know how you can join and look forward to seeing you at an event in the new year. And as Sandy said, today's lunch cannot take place without the support of our wonderful sponsors, Barclays, Prudential, DFS and Good Housekeeping. Without their support, we would not be able to recognise you all in this room and indeed present our special Women of the Year awards. Our thanks and appreciation go to all our sponsors, as well as to the ITV's Lorraine show, who over the last few weeks have been inviting their viewers to nominate their own inspirational women. At Women of the Year, we're very proud of our foundation, established in 2001 with the aim of supporting women both in the UK and internationally. It helps them to prove, improve their lives, support themselves and their communities. This year, we're making three British and three international grants and you'll read more about them in the brochure that you'll receive as you leave. But I'd just like to tell you about one of them, which is in memory of one of our alumni, Marie Colvin, a courageous reporter who, as you know, was tragically killed in Syria four years ago. Our grants will go to the Marie Colvin Journalists Network to provide mentoring and training for women journalists who experience many difficulties when reporting from a war zone or troubled area. We are most grateful for your donations and to our table sponsors, because you all help us continue this important work. Now, as Sandy says, I have some thank yous. Firstly, to Terry Race, our administrator and her assistant, who have worked so hard throughout the year. To my colleagues on the management committee and council for their huge support in making today's lunch a success. Each of them donates their time voluntarily. Many are hosting tables, and they've helped to handpick you all here today. And last but not least, to Sandy. Our president. <laughs> for your support, constant good humour, and obviously for hosting today's lunch so brilliantly. And I'm going to hand back to Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank the brilliant you. Jane Lucan. Yeah. It's like little and large. I thought I'd say it once she'd left, because she could deck me. Right. <laughs> this year, we have five awards, uh, each, uh, each recognising the amazing accomplishment of an exceptional woman. Uh, our first award has been voted by the viewers of The Lorraine Show on ITV, and here to tell us more is honestly one of my heroines on television. She's such a delight, and she's always a pleasure to be interviewed by. In fact, I even was interviewed by her on my wedding day. Uh, please welcome Lorraine Kelly. Thank you, Sandy. It's so good to be here. It's such an, an honour. And I always say this, but I just wish we could somehow bottle all the energy and enthusiasm and, and passion in this room. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's great that you'll be girls here. Yeah. It really is. It's just lovely. You know, that's like a dynasty. I really like that. We were absolutely overwhelmed, honestly, overwhelmed by the, the number of incredible nominees for our Inspirational Women of the Year Award. And along with Sandy and, and lovely Judy Murray, who's here this afternoon, we had to whittle down this massive list into just three. It was really hard, wasn't it? It was so, so tough. To be honest with you, the three women who are here uh, with us this afternoon, as far as I'm concerned, they're all winners. They are absolutely remarkable. And here's just a sum of what they get up to in their story. Our first nominee is Lizzie Jones. She is compassionate. She's selfless. She's very positive. And having gone through such tragedy, she's 
coming out on top. Lizzie's husband died suddenly while playing rugby. He had an undetected heart condition and Lizzie has campaigned for improved cardiac screening for all rugby divisions. She's also set up a charity to fund defibrillators. My hopes and dreams for the charity is to expand it. Hearts don't choose sports and we need to, to push the boundaries and get these defibrillators into all sporting clubs. Jill Harler is our second nominee. She deserves to be recognised for, for just how selfless she is and how much she is doing for her community, for, for, for women everywhere. Jill campaigns tirelessly for greater awareness of ovarian cancer after she was misdiagnosed. She's raised thousands of pounds to create pocket-sized cars that highlight the symptoms. I came up with the acronym ACT NOW and I wanted to design a card that would fit in a lady's handbag. Amanda Root is our third and final nominee. Amanda is one of the most selfless people I know. She has decided to use her artistic skills to turn around parts of society that have been forgotten. Amanda works with women rescued from exploitation and domestic violence, both here and in India. She holds therapeutic art workshops and also uses the techniques to help people suffering from dementia. The arts activities just bring them out of themselves. That's what we do. We know that the arts can transform lives. Three inspirational women doing extraordinary work. Every single one of you, absolutely remarkable. But the winner of the Lorraine Inspirational Women of the Year Award, as voted for by our viewers, is Lizzie Jones. beautiful two ladies that I've been with all this morning. You are just incredible. And we'll share this. Um, oh, sorry. I want to dedicate this to every woman in here, but in particular to mums. I'm a single parent. I didn't intend to be, but I'm not giving up. I'm making a difference in Danny's memory. Um, I want to change lives and make lives better. Um, these machines are going everywhere. They're spreading out all over the world. We've covered a whole league within rugby already, over 50 defibrillators in, in six months. Um, we've raised over £30,000, and we're, I'm not going to stop. Um, these machines are life and death. They really, really are. You, you're up to 70% safer by having a defibrillator within three minutes um, of getting to it. They, they should be on every street corner. I'm getting them in communities. They're going into schools. I'm working with a Restart Heart project that is training CPR in ch in, with children in schools. Um, there's some fantastic projects out there. Um, and I'm, I'm desperate, desperate to raise awareness. That, that is the key. Um, everybody should know where their nearest defibrillator is. And everybody should know that, you know, heart, hearts don't choose the sports, hearts don't choose the people. These things are silent. Danny had no symptoms, completely and utterly symptomless. Uh, we had no warning. That's why you need to be checked. Um, and you need to know where your nearest machine is that might, might save you one day. Thank you so much for this. I'm so, so proud. <laughs> Our next award is the Prudential Women of the Year Campaigner Award. I'm delighted to ask Denise Goff, uh, the actress, to tell us more about the winner. You may know that Denise won the Olivier Award for Best Actress um, for her astonishing role in People, Places and Things at the National Theatre. It was an astounding insight into the psyche of a woman in turmoil. Please welcome Denise Goff. Thank 
Yeah, I'm kind of in turmoil today with how inspiring this is to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of it. Um, the winner of this award is a writer, television producer and investigative journalist. In 1972, while working for the Sunday Times, she wrote a series of articles highlighting the plight of thalidomide children born in the 1950s and 60s. She then went on to write The Forgotten Illness, exposing the lack of services for people suffering with schizophrenia. As a result, she set up the mental health charity SANE and pioneered the UK's first national out-of-hours mental health helpline, offering information and emotional support 365 days a year. It's almost too much, isn't it? Um, she's been named as one of the most influential people in shaping the history of the National Health Service. This year, SANE celebrates its 30th anniversary. Let's hear more about its work. Mental illness affects one in four of us, so it's still so strange why we find it difficult to talk about. It was over 20 years ago that I wrote the Forgotten Illness series, published in the Times, from which Sane was born. And it was thanks to the media then, and thanks to all of you today, that we've been able to continue our campaign to bring mental illness out of the shadows. Part of the problem is that we don't seem to have had the breakthroughs, as in other fields. SANE is the only charity of its kind to build a research centre devoted to finding out the causes of conditions such as schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder and anxiety. But until we find those breakthroughs and better treatments, we can offer practical information and advice and ongoing emotional support. SANE's confidential helpline and email service is open every day and night of the year. James, pictured here, sadly took his own life, but through his family trust, we are embarking on a major suicide prevention study. Others have been able to reach us. Sophia started harming herself severely at the age of 14. Without SANE, some of us would literally have no one to turn to and I can't find the words to explain how upsetting this is to think about. To present the award, please welcome Jane Rawnsley from Prudential. The Prudential Women of the Year Campaigner Award goes to Marjorie Wallace. I mean, I looked up award ceremonies, actually, and I, I found there was a Tree of the Year Award. And, um, and I thought, you know, the trees don't have to give a speech, do they? But there was an old Nobly from Essex who's 800 years old and um, was apparently a common for witches. Then there was the Robin Hood tree in Sherwood Forest where he used to shelter. And my favourite was a sycamore who'd eaten a bicycle. Um, and... So I didn't think I came into any of these categories, really. I couldn't have those achievements. And, I, and I'm actually really quite surprised to have achieved in such immensely wonderful company because there's no greater critic or judge than your own peers. You know, well, I mean, women will always know if you're not being genuine in what you do. So you know, it's just amazing to be here with all of you achieving women, all of you... <laughs> I know, I can see them, all of them here. They could all be up here instead of me. So um, that is it's also a tribute to uh, the fact that mental illness is being recognised. And you've heard a little bit about the work we do at SANE. Uh, we try to continue doing that as best we can. And uh, we just hope that we'll be able to be there for all the sorts of people that uh, you heard in that uh, video. But... Uh, you know, in this room today, uh, as it's one in four people, at least two people on your table would be directly affected by depression, anxiety, or some other mental condition. And if you extend it to their families, that will be even more. So it's a huge scale of a problem. 
And I'm glad that Theresa May has actually keeping on saying, or saying, that the government is finally going to try and do something. But it's going to take a long time to match the resources. But going back to campaigning, campaigning is a funny thing to do, really, isn't it? I mean, Charles Dickens, I think, was the first campaigner. And he wrote this thing. It said it behoves every journalist to warn his readers that unless they set themselves to amending the dwellings of the poor and their lives, um, they, they will be slaughtered by God. Well, that's a tad too much to say. But he did have a point, which is that if you're going to try and campaign and it, with people's lives, and you have to get immersed in their lives. And as a journalist, I couldn't do interviews on the telephone like many journalists do today. I always had to go and live the life with the lid of my children, see what it was like to have a child with no arms and legs, go into a cafe and watch the queue disappear. Or be there night after night turning a disabled person. Or when somebody who's mentally ill being with the mother in the living room and knowing that the footsteps upstairs would be a psychotic son who might take an overdose any second. But it's only by experiencing them that you can actually then write about them and they can put their trust in you. My children always called it the Method Acting School of Journalism, um, which, is, which it probably was. They didn't appreciate it always because their Sunday treat was to go to Broadmoor. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of help along the way. I'd like particularly to acknowledge that somebody who's in this room today, Margaret Edwards, who has been my head of strategy and communications for over 20 years. And she keeps me grounded. And whenever I get over the top, she gives me what we call the seriousness pill. <laughs> um, but just to sort of end, and it sounds maybe a little sentimental, people say, why do you go on? Why don't you just give up? Why do you go on? And I'm just sort of, there's an uh, uh, Emily Dickinson poem, just a few lines. And it's saying, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If... I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, I shall not live in vain. And in a way, it may sound sentimental, but that is the sort of thing that motivates me. But just to end, I don't want to do quite any, the reality of running a charity for 30 years is sometimes pretty awful. And you have pretty hilarious moments. So I sort of think of my life really as my crest, the Wallace crest. It's about a, it shows an ostrich, don't quite know why, with a, a horseshoe upside down, obviously it can't swallow it, much too big. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, all the, it has worse on it, the motto, sperandum est. Anyone here with Latin training, that means there's always hope, or here's hoping. And that's what I go on doing, here's hoping. presented so many awards in my life, I cannot believe there's a tree awards and nobody asked me. I, I'm left slightly bitter. Right. Um, people keep leaving their speeches. It's like a recycling station. Right. Do you think I'm too short for this podium? I can't decide. Our third award is the Good Housekeeping Women of the Year Courage Award, uh, and it is presented by a former president of the lunch, uh, one of the people I regard as my best friends in all the world. Please welcome Helena Kennedy. Well, it's so great to see you all. Um, this award goes to a woman who was a firefighter, one of the first women, but after hearing about the plight of women and children in the Calais jungle, up sticks and crossed the channel to offer her help. She arrived in Calais, straight from the Glastonbury Festival, where she had been managing the site and was seeing all these abandoned tents. She got a truck, filled it with salvaged camping equipment and quickly became a surrogate mother to the many hundreds of unaccompanied youngsters, irrespective of why they were there. And she's been running the most fabulous center there in the Calais jungle. Let's hear more about it. 
So we've got a dedicated women's centre. Um, the, the bottom line of what we're doing is distribution. So we try to make sure that women and children have got access and families have got access to everything they need, including nappies, baby milks, sanitary products, and of course clothes. We're open all the time for children. We've got a decent space that's warm and dry. So we kind of open up when the children arrive which is quite horribly early um, and uh, light the fire and just provide the space with toys and whatever else um, and it's a place women can get together and relax. Really difficult to prioritise what's the biggest problem here but I guess you know obviously health issues. Uh, most of these people have been on a horrendous journey so nutrition is now a problem. We've got a lot of under 10 year old children um, who haven't had access to decent nutrition. The other serious concern is unaccompanied children who have arrived. Um, smugglers have brought them here and they're pretty much brainwashed to head to the UK. Um, they're putting their lives at risk and I say again, they're as young as 11 and 12 years old. The 17 year old last week that was killed, 14 year old about two months ago. Um, and some of the injuries are awful, you know, they're uh, attempting to go over fences and um, jump on lorries so they come back with various injuries um, and their children, 12-year-old boys. Um, so that's, that, that um, is very upsetting to see. There's... To present the award, please welcome Lindsay Nicholson, Editorial Director of Good Housekeeping. Hello and welcome and truly heartbreaking images. I am however, delighted to announce that the Good Housekeeping Women of the Year Courage Award goes to Liz Clegg. Firstly, um, thank you, thank you all. I humbly accept this award on behalf of the thousands of refugee women fleeing their homes, many, many with young children. If this was not courageous enough, most of them took on a harrowing journey to reach what they thought was the safety of Europe. I have sat with many of them who somehow managed to make it as far as Calais only to have to negotiate with smugglers the price of passage to the UK, a place they still believe will offer them sanctuary. During one recent assessment, a tiny young Eritrean girl, no more than 16, talked about her multiple rapes at the hands of smugglers. The Dublin Three Agreement came into effect on January the 1st, 2014. Yet there is still insufficient government-led action to allow women and many, many children to access their legal right to rejoin their families here in the UK. Some, thankfully, have arrived recently. Yet the arrivals last week were too little and too late for the children who died attempting the crossing. I was pleased to see the Prime Minister here this morning and I am sure that she will now act swiftly to follow this up with many more children. Sadly, this is not the case for the Dubs Amendment. Lord Alf Dubs Amendment was finally passed back in May. This was in response to the lack of resources across Europe to safeguard unaccompanied children with no family in Europe. And the UK agreed to take an unspecified number of these children. To date, not a single child has come to the UK. Amongst these children are 52 unaccompanied girls, the majority between 14 and 16. I know who they are, and the authorities know who they are. I have all their names and contact details. These girls have shown tremendous courage. 
I know that leadership takes courage, and I implore the Prime Minister to show the same amount of courage and to act in a compassionate and humanitarian way to immediately bring these girls to safety. Thank you so much. Uh, the next award is our DFS Women of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award, and here to tell us more about the winner, please welcome Katie Derham. Hello, everyone. What a wonderful room this is to be in. I feel rather small having listened to some of the stories, but also hugely optimistic for my teenage daughters about the world which you are creating for them. But I'm here to talk about a remarkable lady who has been dubbed Field Marshal Fanny, which, <laughs> easy, is no surprise because at the age of 96, she remains a truly extraordinary force of nature. From very modest beginnings, she was awarded a scholarship to the Royal College of Music, where she won most of the piano prizes, and she performed at the proms, quite exquisitely. She then became a hugely successful teacher and wrote the book, Me and My Piano, a copy of which can be found in almost every home where a child has learned the piano over the last 50 years. And I actually went this morning to dig out my copy of this book, which is very dog-eared, which my girls had used as well. And then I remembered that my sister had taken it for her son, Wilfie, who's five. Fanny, I fear it may be a challenge even for you, having heard Wilfie's first efforts. But <laughs> the, the work continues, and marvellous work it is too. In 1961, she founded the Leeds International Piano Competition, which is the most prestigious and influential piano competition in the world. Let's find out some more. Every three years during the month of September, the eyes of the piano world turn to Yorkshire for the Leeds International Piano Competition. Long established as one of music's most coveted prizes since its inception in 1963, the competition was the dream and ambition of a local piano teacher, Fanny Waterman. Having made her name in Leeds as a teacher during the 1950s, Fanny Waterman's life was transformed as she embarked on a remarkable musical journey with fellow pianist Marion Harwood. The origins go back quite a number of years, I think. Um, Fanny Waterman and I started about six years ago or more saying how exciting it would be to have a competition. Or let me be accurate. It was her idea, and she bullied me into agreeing with her. It started um, when I really couldn't get to sleep one night, and I started planning what I was going to do next. And I woke my husband up, and I said, I think we'll have a piano competition in Leeds. And he said, oh, it'll never work here. This must be held in London. And the moment he says anything like this to me, it inspires me to go ahead and prove him to be wrong. The Leeds went from strength to strength. Spanish pianist Rafael Orozco won in 1966. The world took notice when Romanian Radu Lupu captured the first prize three years later. Our competition is for young professionals who have got sufficient repertoire to take on a career because our engagements are the finest in the world to play with the four London orchestras, the Liverpool Phil, a tour with the Halley. And that is really what has put leaves at the top and we've got to stay there here to present the award please welcome dfs chief marketing officer it's tony wood and the dfs women of the year lifetime achievement award goes to dame fanny waterman My 
humanity and woman of achievement. This is indeed a very great honor. I have been lucky in my time and received many honors, but for some reason, this touches me more than ever. And when I had the message inviting me, I burst into tears because I remembered my parents, my wonderful husband, because through their journey and hope and aspiration for me, I am where I am today. And we shall always remember this, and not only them, what about our teachers? What about our pupils? You are only where you are by everyone who helps you. And as you heard, when my husband said to me, it will not work in Leeds, it has to be in a capital city, because he was from London, I said, <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> There we go, fantastic. Uh, and, and Dame Fanny's absolutely right. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Transport for London for getting me where I am today, so. <laughs> I'm doing my best here, people. Um, from one extraordinary woman to another, this lady has changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of poor children in Pakistan. Here to tell us about this year's winner of the Barclays Women of the Year Award is Sarah Khan, director of the charity Inspire. Hello everyone. It's such an honour to be asked to introduce the winner of this next award. She has been described to be one of Pakistan's most successful businesswomen. But what makes her truly extraordinary is her incredible philanthropic work spanning over a period of almost 30 years. Often in the face of hostility as she challenged educational, societal, cultural and political norms. And her story begins back in 1988 in a rural village in Pakistan, where she found herself being followed by children who she, who she describes as all barefoot, matted hair and runny noses. There were no schools in this village and they had nowhere to go. And rather than thinking that this was someone else's problem, she decided she would do something about it. And through sheer hard work and dedication, she set up a school for these children where, as she said, she counted every brick and every bag of cement. At the end of the first year, 850 pupils were attending her school. Today, this inspirational woman now oversees an incredible 716 schools, teaching 210,000 children. Let's hear more about this amazing woman. Well, care really came out of, uh, came into being uh, as a result of the flood of 1988. So we really went out in the flood to help people who had been totally devastated, you know. And I realized that education was the only gift that we could give to people, which no flood could take away, which no one can take away, which would become a part of them and help them change their lives themselves. And when we opened that school on the 17th of January, 1991, 250 children had lined up outside. I want to be a teacher when I grow up and I like this school so much. Care has provided us with the facility of education. Not only education, it has provided us quality edu education. I graduated from Care in 2005. I joined Pakistan Army in 2013. Uh, they actually built my communication skills, my confidence skills. But my parents were not financially well to sponsor my education. So Care also gave me scholarship. I graduated from Care in 2007 and it gave me vision and exposure. 
realize that there are millions of jobs in the country if you have a good education. We hope are changing the lives of their community, of their family, and hope one day they will change the destiny of the country too. And here to present the award, quite simply, the nicest woman from a bank that I've ever met. Please welcome Andrea Bonafé from Barclays. Good afternoon. Um, coming to the end of yet another inspiring lunch, um, it's my honour to announce that the Barclays Women of the Year Award goes to um, Sima Aziz. Thank you. It's on my phone. So Can I do that? <laughs> I hope it'll come on. That's my... Uh... Otherwise, you'll have a very odd picture of yourself. <laughs> Doing what? A selfie? <laughs> I don't think it's a selfie unless you do the duck face. <laughs> so thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be here. Uh, it's absolutely amazing for me out of the blue. I'm truly honored that to all the people who picked me, who decided that the work was important. I want to thank the organizers and everyone connected to the awards. I think it's an absolutely amazing thing. It's, I'm uh, honored to be here and honored to receive this award and even more honored to receive it in such esteemed company. I flew in yesterday from Pakistan and all the women that I've met the organizers that I've met, the stories that I've, I've heard have totally blown me away. And I, wonder, I'm, I'm, I understand what an amazing energy there is and what fabulous people, what fabulous work women are doing. And it's truly humbling. So I'd like to tell you a little about the work that I do. And of course, the award does not belong to me at all. It is to the, to the people, to the teams, to the care teams, to the teachers, to the students, their families, and the teams who've done tireless work in unbelievable circumstances, in very difficult times, always beyond the call of duty. And it is because of them that it is possible for us to continue with our mission of providing a quality equalizing education to as many children of our country as we can. I believe and I don't know, you know, in countries like this, where education is not a problem, I do understand that the world has forgotten and maybe does not understand how big a tragedy it is to be illiterate. And education is one of the most fundamental of human rights, the lack of which actually creates an inherent and inescapable deprivation of all other human rights by creating poverty, hunger, unemployment, and disease. I mean, can you think of one job that an illiterate can do or any life which illiterate, what, what, do, what does society have to offer the illiterate? And sadly, millions of children around the world have no access to education through no fault of their own. I also believe that, and it, as we all do at CARE, that it is the duty of people like ourselves to, who have this right to make sure that our children who have not an access to education get that access to, to the education, which is their right, so that they can leave lead uh, real uh, lives and reach their full potential. So today we are providing a quality education to 230,000 children across Pakistan, but we believe our work has just started. With 9 million children out of school in Pakistan and 110 million school children out of school worldwide, we, we, I believe that together we can do much more. The world is like a global village today. I sincerely believe that good in any part of the world affects the whole world. And tragedy and sadness in any part of the world affects us all, whether we like it or not. So I'd 
first like to congratulate all the women who are here today, to all the fabulous contributions that everybody has made to so many amazing causes that we've just seen. And forums like these are amazing places for the energy that it's generating truly moves me and I feel that rush of energy. And I hope that together we will make a more sustainable world. And I believe that with combined effort, we can one day ensure that we create a world where every child enjoys the basic right to education, to self-respect, to freedom from poverty, and freedom from disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been worrying about people leaving their speeches behind, but you know, if everybody did them on phones and then left those behind, I could make a fortune. I was just... <laughs> uh, that wonderful, uplifting story, alas, brings to an end. Yet another amazing lunch, uh, celebrating amazing women and their extraordinary achievements. Uh, if you want to know more, and I'm sure that you do, there's lots of information on the Women of the Year website. And of course, please don't forget uh, to look at our new exciting alumni club. Uh, I'm sure you've met people that you want to stay in touch with. That's a great way of doing it. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you again uh, at the first event, which is in January uh, of next year. I hope you have been inspired by those you have met and heard from today. Let it encourage all of you to keep trying to improve the world. I know you can do it, and it certainly wants doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.